everyone, it's Ms. Lopez. In this video, I'm going to talk about proteins, one of the four macromolecules we are covering for chapter two and chapter three. Proteins have a wide variety of functions. Um, they can be enzymes, they can be defensive proteins such as antibodies, they can be uh, regulatory proteins, they can be receptor proteins, they can be uh, storage for energy, they can also be structural support, they can be, uh, they can transport molecules such as oxygen with hemoglobin, um, they can also play a role in genetic regulation. So you can see from this list that proteins have a wide variety of functions. Proteins are made of amino acids and amino acids are, have a very common um, structure to them. It is a central carbon and that central carbon has four bonding sites. To one of them is going to be just a regular old hydrogen. That's it, just a hydrogen. The other two, two of the other ones are going to also be similar for every amino acid. That is the carboxyl group and the amine group. These are two functional groups I need you to know. Sometimes your carboxyl group will be written as COOH, and sometimes your amine group is gonna be written as NH2. And the reason why um, you see them written both ways is because sometimes this hydrogen flips over and comes to this side. And so this molecule is actually what's known as a Zwitter ion. It's capable of ionizing itself when this hydrogen moves back and forth. Um, I like to write it as COOH because when we start talking about dehydration synthesis, I like for my students to be able to see where that uh, hydrogen and oxygen are coming from in dehydration synthesis. So you'll see me typically write this as COOH, but just know that it's, it's acceptable to also see it written as COO- for your carboxyl group and NH3 for your amine group. Everything here is the same for all the amino acids. It's this R group that is different and that R group can be hydrophobic, it can be hydrophilic, it can be what we call aromatic. You don't have to memorize um, the 20 different amino acids, but you need to recognize that it's this R group that makes each amino acid behave differently. So it's another great example of how structure affects function. Only 20 amino acids occur extensively in the proteins of all organisms. There are other ones, but they're just not as common. And they're referred to, they're grouped together according to the R group property. So as I mentioned, you can have some that are hydrophobic, some that are hydrophilic. Um, these R groups can sometimes contain sulfur in them as well. And if they do contain sulfur, you can actually form what's called a disulfide bridge. And that disulfide bridge, di just means two, it's two sulfurs in between them. I know we had you guys learning that, carbo that the proteins are made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, but just know that there are some exceptions. And in this case, if it contains that sulfur, um, such as cysteine, then um, it's, it's just an exception to the rule. But normally all of them will are guaranteed to contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. It's just that some can form, have that sulfide and those form what we call disulfide bridges. Amino acids are linked together by dehydration reactions or condensation reactions to form those peptide linkages. And uh, polymerization, which is just when you start adding to these molecules, when you start building your polymers, um, is gonna take place between the amino acid and the carboxyl group. So let me show you how that looks. You have an amine group here. You have a carboxyl group here, okay? This right here, if that's your amino group, then this is the carboxyl for this amino acid. And then over here in this amino acid, there's your central carbon, there's a carboxyl group, there's the amine group. And what they're going to do is you are going to remove water from one of the amine groups and one of the carboxyl groups. You don't take the water from this amine group and this carboxyl from the same amino acid. When you, when you remove that water, it's coming from both of the monomers. Okay, so we're gonna need the H2O from amino group 
and the carboxyl group of another molecule. And when that happens, when you remove that water, you get what is known as a peptide linkage. So you're gonna see this link right here is between, that's what's left over of the carboxyl group. And this is what's left over of the amine group. And that right there is that peptide bond. So they've drawn here in water, they put in water, or not in water, I'm sorry, in blue, the H2O, see that? The H2O, that gets removed to form the water. And then what's left behind, they link together and that's known as your peptide linkage. Um, so when proteins are made, they form what is known as uh, structure levels or protein folding levels. Um, and there's four of them. The primary structure of a protein is the specific sequence of amino acid. This is determined by the DNA. So you may remember from ninth grade, the snack lab, where you had to build a snack. Um, what you were doing there is modeling the process by which proteins are made. So you were given DNA, you had to take the DNA, and you had to convert it into mRNA. And then you take the mRNA and you use it to form proteins by looking up the specific amino acids. Well, what you were doing in ninth grade when you were doing that is what's known as the primary structure of a protein. It's the amino acid sequence itself, okay? So you still have those central carbons. Right here, there's a central carbon. Right here, there's a central carbon. But they get organ, they don't just randomly get put together. They get put together in a specific sequence. So let's just call, um, let's say this one's valine. So that's valine, that's threonine, that's tryptophan, that's phenylalanine. So the order, which is determined by the DNA, is what's known as your primary structure but there's more to it than that. So that's what you guys learned in ninth grade. You learned the process of how to make those proteins. That was just that primary structure. There's also the secondary structure. So once you start forming these long beads, these long beads, these amino acid chains, um, they start to fold in on themselves based on interactions between the molecule. So the secondary level of protein folding is as this, this chain is starting to form, um, it'll start to fold in on itself. And it's either gonna form an alpha helix or a beta pleat. And that's known as the secondary structure. It results from hydrogen bonding. Okay, so here is the example of what that, that alpha helix looks like. So it's kind of like a spiral. And then beta pleat is more of an accordion shape. And again, it's still those hydrogen bonds that are causing it to fold up this way. Then in your tertiary level of folding, what happens is that bent and folded molecule is gonna start to fold and bend even more. And with the tertiary structure, as you can see here, they've got um, as they start to form, you've got some that are beta pleats, you've got some that are helixes, and they don't just bend randomly. There's a specific shape and way they have to fold. Yet another great example of how structure affects function. And in that tertiary structure, it's mostly the R groups that are going to determine that tertiary structure. Not the carboxyl, not the amine, although they do have some influence, it's mostly going to be those R groups that determine that, that tertiary structure. You can have disulfide bridges like we talked about earlier with the sulfur groups. You can have hydrogen bonds. You can have the hydrophobic interactions kind of coming together to avoid the aqueous environment they're in. You can also have van der Waal interactions between those hy hydrophobic side chains. And you can even have ionic interactions forming what are called salt bridges. So all of these different interactions are, are attracting or pushing away from each other to form what is known as your tertiary structure, your tertiary folding. Um, once, an, uh, an, a, once a protein is exposed to something that's going to break those interactions, break the hydrogen bonds, break those, inner, um, those uh, disulfide bridges, um, your protein has become what is called denature. So usually it's heat or chemicals that disrupt those weaker interactions, destroying that secondary and tertiary level of folding. And then if it's not too extreme, the protein can return to normal and is no longer denatured. 
But there is a case where you can get, you can't get to a point where denaturing completely destroys the protein and it no longer functions the same way. Great example of this is when you are using, um, I'm sorry, when you are using egg whites. So when you cook egg whites, they turn white. That's because the heat has changed the protein in the egg white. It no longer has the same shape. It no longer has the same function. And so you can see a difference between raw eggs and cooked eggs in that egg white. It's a very noticeable difference. Quaternary structure is the last level of protein folding. This is when two or more separate chains come together and interact. Very, very weak forces, but still holding it together to form your functional protein. So this right here is an example of hemoglobin. You can see that it's got two different sections, what are called your alpha and your beta units, and they are coming together and interacting and holding together, um, but they are different chains. So this right here is one chain. This blue is one chain. This green is a different polypeptide chain, but they're interacting together and that forms that quaternary structure. This is another kind of like cartoonized example of the quaternary structure. So you can see that you've got one, two, three, four different protein, or pro, uh, not, not protein, polypeptide chains. And the polypeptide chains, you can see a little bit of alpha helix, that is secondary level. And then it's folding in on itself, that's tertiary level. Um, and then the way that they come together forms that quaternary structure and that forms your functional protein. Um, things that can disrupt your functional protein. So um, denature, things that can denature your protein, things that can interrupt that quaternary, secondary, and tertiary level of protein folding. Temperature, this is usually gonna to be too high temperature. Concentration of H+, which is also known as pH. So your concentration of your hydrogen ion, which is that H+, is also known as pH. Um, so you can have a decrease in pH or an increase in pH, and that's going to affect your proteins as well. High concentrations of polar substances, um, because that's going to affect those hydrophobic interactions, and non-polar substances also, such as um, either salts or other molecules with those polar versus non-polar um, environments, are also going to affect the way that your protein behaves. Really hope this video was helpful to you guys. I know that the protein folding can be a little bit tricky, so check the um, description box below for a link to a helpful animation that hopefully will clear up the difference on those protein foldings. Hope this was helpful. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.